So uh, I'd like to let you into kind of my story and, and uh, just share a little bit about my wife, actually her story. So she, uh, she loves rugby. I mean, like abnormally so, more, more than any other woman I've kind of met before, but she really, really loves rugby. She, she's an avid supporter. She, she kind of, when I was introduced to her, she, she had uh, the rugby jersey, uh, she had the face paint, uh, she had uh, the flag. Uh, I even think on our first date, she was wearing the Springbok socks, uh, but I, I said I wouldn't tell you that. But anyway, she looked at the stats, uh, she loved you know, the, the Springbok rugby side, and all she wanted to do was meet these guys, you know, meet these players. And if she could just meet them, uh, you know how when you meet these players, you just wanna get their signatures and, and then you have their signatures and you can just kind of idol worship. Well, anyway, we go into one of my favorite places, Santon City, and we get this um, parking ticket and I play a game like, how quickly can we get out of there? You know, if, if we can beat the 30 minute thing, we don't need to pay for that parking. My wife kind of sees Santon City as a, an amusement park where she wants to kind of try every ride. Anyway, we're walking in Santon City and we, we go into the shop and, and Kirst picks out one of these sports items and um, she bumps into this rugby legend. But I mean, this huge guy. And, and literally she, she like walks into him and then she looks up and she realizes who it is that she's just walked into. Now, if I can describe this moment to you, it's like she almost passes out. Her, her her voice box physically changes. Uh, she, she, she goes kind of all faint, and, and my wife, she has this unique ability, she just goes red. So she, she goes red, and then she does the strangest thing. She turns around and she runs out the store. I think even with the clothing, I don't know if security got involved or whatever, but she was gone, she was out of there. And I'm standing there and I'm like, hey, how's it, Dory? My, my wife's just a, a, you know, a fanatic rugby supporter. And this rugby legend looks at me and he waves or whatever and we both pack out laughing. Now when I think about this story, it's like, you, you know, she, she, she really wanted to meet these, you know, these rugby legends, but she wasn't ready. You know, it was the greatest desire of her heart, but when it happened, she wasn't ready for it. And when I have been thinking about Rosebank this last week, that's what I think maybe potentially the space we could be in. You know, when it comes to our relationship with God, it sounds like for many of us, we really wanna meet God. We really wanna meet with God. But, but the real question is, are we actually ready to stand before God? You know, the, the, the word on the street or, or when, when, we, when we listen to, to the leadership's heart's desire, it's like we, we want revival. You know, we, 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 we want uh, an extraordinary manifestation of God's presence. We wanna be awakened. We, we wanna be closer and meet with the living God. But are we ready? You know, and many of you might object and say, but, but Ryan, don't we have God's Holy Spirit? Doesn't he, he live in us already? Now, now that's true, but, but revival is when there's this, this kind of extraordinary manifestation of God, where he, he awakens us to me. It's like he cuts the callous of our hearts and, and we feel the breeze afresh in a new way. And, and in our songs, God, we, we're waiting here for you. We sing songs like that. And, and in our talk, it's like, God, we, we want revival. And when you look at our country and, and the state that it's in, you hear of these prayer meetings that are being organized where thousands and thousands of people are gathering saying, God, come near to us. But are we ready to really stand before God? Or will we, like my wife, end up running away? You see, we're, we're no different to the nation of Israel. Because where we picked up in our series of Samuel last week, Israel recognized that God was now speaking to Samuel, that Samuel could be close to God. And it was like, like God could be with us. God could be manifesting himself again in a, in a unique way. And Israel was in a desperate situation. Buildings were being burnt down. Everyone would, was doing what was right in their own eyes. Judgment had started in the church and in the house of God, but God became present to Samuel. And, and, it's, and when we read this account that we're gonna look at today, it's like you, you, you get a sense, but were Israel really ready 
for the presence of God? Were they really ready for this revival? And so we're gonna look at God visiting five unique kinds of people. And we're gonna see in this account today how these people actually weren't ready for what they wanted. And this whole account revolves around the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Now, now this ark was, was an ark designed by Moses, instructed by God, and, and this ark resided in the tabernacle, in a tent that, that, the, that the spiritual leaders set up. And all the 12 tribes of Israel would surround this, this tent. The tribe of Dan, the tribe of Gad, uh, all these tribes would surround, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord resided in this tabernacle. Now, now inside this ark were these two stone tablets referred to as the 10 commandments. Now, I don't know if you're interested in this, but I was really interested. I always thought that there were two uh, stone tablets because th there were five commandments on the one and five commandments on the other. But I actually came to realize that, that no, in ancient Israel, the way a contract worked is the way that a contract works today. Uh, one party has a contract, the other party has a copy. And this was a covenantal agreement between God and Israel. And this contractual agreement, this covenant, resided in this ark. There was also a, a manna from the wilderness. As this ark would, would, would be lifted up uh, by priests and be carried around the wilderness, so Israel would move with it. And, and, and inside this ark was manna from the days to remind Israel that God provides. God provides, God provides. But the biggest thing that the ark of the covenant of the Lord signified is that this was the manifestation of God's very presence, the holy God's presence, close to Israel. That, that when, when Israel crossed the Jordan, God was there. That, that when, when Israel overcame Jericho, the ark of the covenant of the Lord was there. That when God was present, he spoke, he spoke to Moses directly from this place, from the ark of the covenant of the Lord. And in this account, we see that this ark, it's almost dealt with like a hot potato. And it visits five unique, different kinds of people. And in this account, we will see that Israel maybe wanted God and wanted revival, and wanted God to do a new work, but that they weren't ready for what they wanted. And so we see God visiting the religious user. This is where he makes his first stop, represented in the ark of the covenant of the Lord. So you can pick up with me in this story in 1 Samuel chapter four, verse one. Now the Israelites, they went out to fight against the Philistines, and the Israelites camped at Ebenezer, and the Philistines at Apek. Now, now when it comes to a battle, uh, this was very significant for Israel because the battle was everything. If you lost the battle, you would become subject and you would serve that nation. If you won the battle, well then that nation would serve you. So your very livelihood was at stake in a battle. And so Israel go out and they stand on the battle line and battles kind of consisted of a few days and on day one, Israel lost 4,000 men. And, and the soldiers that, that lived returned back to the camp and they ask a significant question, a question that many of us ask when it comes to the battle of our lives. They, they get together and the elders say, when the soldiers returned, it says, when the soldiers returned to the camp, the elders of Israel asked, why did the Lord bring defeat on us today before the Philistines? Why did we lose? Why, why is life going so badly for us? Why didn't we win that battle? What's going on? And as the elders wrestled with this question, it's like, you know, did, did, we, did we put the wrong men in charge? Have we, have we not had adequate training? Uh, th this, this is the kind of question that, that companies ask, that churches ask that maybe you're asking in your life. It's definitely the question that the pirates, you know, the buccaneers should be asking today uh, if you watch the Ned Bank Cup final. But, but it's a really important question. And guess what they come up with? They come up with this answer. They say, guys, the, the reason that we lost 
is because the ark of the covenant of the Lord wasn't with us. And so they shout out and say, let us bring the ark of the Lord's covenant from Shiloh, because that is where this ark resided, so that he may go with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. And so th this ark of the covenant is carried by Eli's two boys, Hophni and Phinehas, and they carry this ark into the camp, and it's like the ground shook. Israel started singing war cries. This means we're gonna win. In fact, they shouted so loud that the Philistines could hear it, and they started murmuring. The soldiers started saying, a God is in their camp. And the Philistines were, were familiar with this Israel God. They were familiar with, the, with what God had done in the Exodus. But these commanding officers go to the Philistine military and they say, be men and fight, you know, or you're gonna be subject to them. I mean, it's just filled with, with great, you know, I love, I love, you should read your Bibles. Anyway, Hophni and Phinehas, they carry this ark to the battleground. And this is what happens. So the Philistines, they fought. And again, the Israelites were defeated and every man fled to his tent. Can you imagine that battle? Can you imagine being in the camp and seeing these men fully grown run and hide in their tents? The slaughter, I mean, the slaughter was very great. Israel got butchered in this battle. They lost 30,000 foot soldiers on that day. But more horrific than that, the ark of the covenant of God was captured and Eli's two boys, Hophni and Phinehas, died. And here we see that a nation and an eldership and a leadership and a religious user that's gonna use the presence of God to win the battle of their life, to win the battle for their nation, to use God almost like, like the Ark of the Covenant was like their, their rabbit foot. You know, they treated God like a waiter. You know, I don't know if you go to a restaurant and, 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 and you, you kind of order from the waiter and you call over the waiter when you need the waiter, you know, but, but the rest of the time, the waiter doesn't have a seat at the family table. The, 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 the waiter's not part of this family. And, and that's how Israel was treating God. You know, we need you now to win our battles, so, so rock up. And, and for many of us, I think we use God's presence in this way. We use God's presence to win the battles of our life. And, and maybe you're not a Christian, or, or maybe you are, but, but you look at our culture and we'll, we'll, we'll refer to star signs or tarot cards or, or new moon festivals, which is the new corporate thing of these days, all to make your life succeed. Or, or we'll, we'll use St. Christopher's in the car to, to protect us in our journeys, or, or we'll have crosses around our necks. Uh, or I remember invigilating a matric, uh, a matric examinations and these boys, they all had these rosaries on their desk as if this, this rosary was this rabbit foot that, that God's presence could be used for them to win the battle of their life. You see, the big question that Israel needed to answer and that we need to answer is, is God here for us or are we here for him? God cannot be used and whoever is gonna use God's presence is not ready for God to visit them it ends up in slaughter all the time. And so the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, as we move to the next scenario, well, they, the Ark of the Covenant left spiritual robbers, people that were, were robbing from God. And we learn that the same day, a Benjamite, well, he ran from the battle line and he went to Shiloh, where the Ark of the Covenant resided with his clothes torn and dust on his head. And he, he goes to this town and he tells the news. He's like, w w you know, Israel are in trouble. We, we've lost this battle. The ark is gone. And, and the town cries out. They start weeping. And Eli, the senior pastor of that town, well, he's sitting in his chair rocking and he hears what's going on. And somehow he gets the messenger to come to him. And he says to this Benjamite messenger, please tell me what's happening. And this messenger retells Eli everything and says, Israel fled before the Philistines and the army has suffered heavy losses. And also, I just wanna, I just wanna break the news to you. Your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were they dead? 
and the ark of the covenant of God has been captured. Can you imagine hearing this news as Eli just takes it and it's just getting worse and worse and worse and worse. This dad has lost his boys. But when the Benjamite, when he mentioned, when he mentioned the ark of God, this senior pastor, Eli, this elite leader, this person who, who, who handled the ark of the covenant, the presence of God, he fell backward off his chair by the side of the gate. The one who stood before the presence of the Lord was now backward and fell over his chair and his neck was broken and he died. And the author gives us the reason why. Yes, he was an old man. But the author includes this little interesting bit that he didn't need to put in. He says, and Eli was heavy. In other words, the same word that is used for glory, the same word that is used for the weight of God's presence is used of Eli, that Eli was glory, that Eli was, was heavy. Why was Eli heavy? Why was Eli fat? because he took the offering of the Lord. He took what belonged to God. He robbed from God. People would come and give their offerings and Eli turned this church thing into a family business and it made him duck. It made him fat. And he started robbing from what belonged to God. He took glory away from God. The church does it all the time. And he led Israel for 40 years. Now, Phineas, uh, Phineas' wife was pregnant on this day. Uh, well, she, she got pregnant before this day, but she was pregnant at this time. And she gets wind of the news of what had happened. And she heard that her father-in-law, Eli, was dead, that her husband, Phineas, was dead. And she heard that the ark of God, the presence of the Lord, had been captured. And, and, and she went into labor pains. In fact, she was so overcome by this overwhelming news that she started dying as she was giving birth. Now the midwives were trying to comfort her. You, um, don't worry, uh, you, you're having a baby boy. And she did not care. You know, she, she, she paid no attention to what they were saying. And she named this baby boy, she gave this baby boy a name that she wanted everyone to know him by, that represented this day. She named the boy Ichabod. She's like, when you look at my son, you call him Ichabod. When you bump into my son, you greet him as Ichabod. She named the boy Ichabod saying that the glory, that the weight, that the heaviness of God, that the glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured. Can you imagine this baby boy in Israel walking around? No, no opa, no, no dad, no uncle, no mom. This boy would have, the news would have spread throughout Israel. And every time an Israelite would have looked at this boy, they would have said, Ichabod, where is the glory? That's what the name meant. Where is the glory? Gone. Now, in one sense, the glory of God was in the Philistine territory. But in another sense, the author is making the point that the glory of God was around Opa's waist, around Eli's belly. That's where the glory of God was, the heaviness of God. And because of that, this was the end of Shiloh, that local church gathering where God used to meet with his people. This is so depressing that God had left Shiloh. This, this was the place that people came and saw sacrifice for their sins and they were forgiven. Shiloh was the place where God's word was handled. Shiloh was the place where God was present Sunday after Sunday. Shiloh was the place where young Samuel had been discipled. Guys, Shiloh was the place where God met Hannah in a unique way. Shiloh is now the place where Pam Golding puts a sign outside and says, for sale, because the glory of God, the weight of God has left. Can I ask us a question that I think the Israel community and that church at Shiloh should have asked? Are we getting heavier in our own eyes and is God getting lighter? 
are we getting fatter and fatter in our own eyes, bringing more and more attention to ourselves, to our lives, to who we are, notice me, look at me. I, I, I'm bringing more and more and more attention and is God becoming flippant and lighter and, 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 and kind of in the periphery? You see, when we rob from God, we aren't ready to meet with God's presence. When we abuse God's presence, he leaves Shiloh's and he leaves local churches. He's done it then and he does it today. Anyway, the ark of the covenant of the Lord, the presence of God moves to the, idol the, the tolerant idolater. You see, after the Philistines had captured the ark of God, they took it from Ebenezer, they took it 50 kilometers down to Ashdod. And then they carried the ark into Dagon's temple. Now, now Dagon was an idol, and Dagon was, was, was the Philistine god, and he was the god of, of agriculture and fertility. People would have looked to Dagon for, for provision, for, for food, you know, the, 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 the PSC, the Philistine Stock Exchange, and that industry, that industry would have depended upon Dagon and, and, and how the culture was doing. The livelihood of the Philistines depended on this God. And, and, and their fertility, their next generation, you know, continuation depended on this God. And they took the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and they set it beside Dagon. Yahweh is just another God. He's just another kind of, very tolerant, the defender of faiths, you know, we'll just put him there. But when the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground before the Ark of the Lord. Can you imagine that sight? The priests walk in and Dagon's on his face. And so, like you do with your God, you know, you, you, you fashion, they took, they took Dagon, Dagon didn't lift himself up, but they took Dagon and put him back in his place because gods need help, right? Well, that's what they do. But the following morning, when they rose, there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. His head and hands had been broken off. Now, I know for many of us, we don't have idols in our home you know, I'm not gonna go to lunch with you and see a little idol in your bathroom. Maybe there is, I don't know. And maybe in our African context, yes, there are some that worship Christ and ancestors. There's syncretism, there's ancestral worship. But what is going on here for us? What, what is the significant thing? The question that the Philistines needed to answer, that we need to answer, is what is God's greatest competition in your life? What hope is God competing with? in your life? What are you really looking to, you know, to, to, to bring about provision or fertility? What, what, what is God's greatest competition? Do you have multiple loves? Because whatever that thing is, it cannot be put against God. When God visits a home, when God visits a church, when God visits an area with his presence, idols must be torn down. That's what he does. The tolerant, um, the tolerant idolater cannot stand. What is God's greatest competition? Is it your work? Is it that relationship? Is it your money? Is it your time? Where are you, where are you at? Do you have multiple loves before the Lord your God? Anyway, God moves on. The Ark of the Covenant moves from here into the hands of the ignorant unbeliever. Now let's just re recap the Ark of the Covenant's tour. Look at this map with me. The Ark of the Covenant leaves Shiloh and gets taken to the battle here uh, at Apec. Uh, they lose the battle there and they carry the Ark of the Covenant to Ashdod. And it's in this vicinity, the Philistine territory is made up of five cities of Ashdod, Ashkelon, Gaza, Goth, and Ekron. And these Philistines start playing hot potato with the Ark of the Covenant because God is now present in an extraordinary manifestation in their town. And these ignorant unbelievers uh, don't know what's coming their way. So the Ark of the Covenant resides now in Ashdod. And it says the Lord's hand was heavy, was weighty, was glorious. The Lord's hand was very heavy on the people of Ashdod and its vicinity. He brought devastation on them. 
How did he bring devastation? He brought devastation on and afflicted them with tumors. You see, God goes after the very thing that they were hoping for. God goes after their land and God sends this plague of rats and it devastates their agricultural lands. And, and some of the commentators say that through these rodents, uh, this, this disease was carried. It was like a bubonic plague. And, and these, these Philistine people started picking up tumors. <laughs> what's, what's interesting about this word is that uh, the other word for it is swellings. And it's referring to the Philistines' testicles. I know, it's shocking. But, but these guys' testicles were swelling and they were dying. And, and so, you know, the question is, where is Dagon, your God of agriculture and of fertility? You cannot put God in the same box. And he went after their very hopes and it was devastating. God had destroyed their, their Dagon God in the temple God now, because of his presence, went after their hope, their land, using rats and their bodies with tumors. So the five rulers, they call a, a national conference in Ashdod. And they say, guys, we need to play hot potato with this ark. Let's get rid of it. So they send it to Gath. The people in Gath have the same experience. And they're like, hang on, we need to send this thing to Ekron. And when the Ekron people realize this, look at this. So they sent the ark of God to Ekron. And as the ark of God was entering Ekron, the people of Ekron, they, they cried out. They have brought the ark of God of Israel around to us to kill us and our people. So, so they called together all the rulers of the Philistines. They bring them together and said, listen guys, send the ark of God of Israel away. Get his presence away from us, we don't want God, get rid of him. For death has filled the city with panic. God's hand, his glory, his weight was very heavy. So these five rulers, they meet again. And this had been going on for seven months. And they say, guys, we need a guilt offering. Uh, so they call these Philistine sorcerers in and they say, what should we do? So the sorcerers get together and they tell the five rulers, they say, you know what you should do? Make models, what you should do is make models of the tumors and of the rats that are destroying the country and give glory to, the, to Israel's God. Perhaps he will lift his hand from you and your gods and your land. Now, can you just imagine this? That you make a, a golden testicle, you know, five of them and, and golden rats and you think that that's gonna appease the presence of God. I mean, this is just, this is just hysterical. Anyway, they do this and they send it on its way. But the people, the, the rulers wanna know, is this of God or is this by chance? Did this devastation really come from Yahweh or not? So these sorcerers say, you know what you must do? You take these testicles, I mean these, uh, uh, these tumors and the rats, and you put it on a new cart. And you take this new cart and you attach it to cows. Cows that have never been yoked. They've never walked with a cart before. And then you take these cows that are suckling their young and you take the young and you put it in a pen, okay? You put them in a pen. And then you ask the cows to head toward the direction of the Israelites. If they go against their maternal instincts, then you can know that this is from God. And you know what happens with these cows? The cows went straight up toward Beth Shemesh. They went straight up toward Israel's territory. And he has a nation, the Philistines, that, that treat God like, like all other religions. He's equal to all other religions, all other faiths, all other idols. They were familiar with the stories of the Exodus. But they experienced devastation. They start saying, get the presence of God away. And they realize that this isn't by chance, it's because God is present. Yes, God spoke to them through cows and not prophets. Yes, he gave them some truth and not the whole Torah. But they knew that God's presence was dangerous. And for us, are our friends, our, our, our ignorant unbelievers, our family, is our country ready for an extraordinary manifestation of God? You see, ignorant unbelievers here, they weren't ready. They experienced devastation. Now the God of Israel makes his last visitation to the irreverent believer. 
Now the people of Beth Shemesh, <laughs> if the people of Beth Shemesh were harvesting their wheat in the valley. And when they looked up and saw the ark, they rejoiced at the sight. They're like, God is back. God is moving here again. God's doing something in our midst. And there's a celebration amongst these priests because Beth Shemesh was, was made up of lots of priests. So they chop up the cart and they sacrifice these cows as a burnt offering and they place the Ark of the Covenant on this large rock. And look what happens. But God struck down some of the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh. Can you imagine that? God just kills them putting 70 of them to death because they looked into the ark of God. You see, these irreverent believers, they handled the ark of the covenant of the Lord wrongly. They, they, they did three things. They knew they, they, they put this ark out in the open on a large rock when it should have been in a tabernacle and covered. They sacrificed cows when they knew their law said, you sacrifice lambs. And they, they took a little sneak peek Inside, We just wanna see if everything's there. And they knew that that was forbidden. You don't handle the presence of God that way with such irreverence. Now, we don't have an ark today, but, but Jesus is the fulfillment of the ark of the old covenant. You, you know, Jesus says, my blood is the blood of the, of the new covenant. And, and the question is, do we sometimes approach Christ with that irreverence? Do we handle his commands with that kind of irreverence? You know, we look in the New Testament that, that in Corinth, the pastors started burying more people than they used to because people were just pegging all over the place. And, and Paul carried along by the Holy Spirit. Well, he comes to Corinth and he says, you know why people are dying? Because of e the irreverence that you approach the table of communion with. You're approaching Christ flippantly. You think you can rush in and you can rush out and people are dying, just like this scenario. Now the people mourned because of the heavy blow the Lord had dealt them. And the people of Beth Shemesh, they ask this question. They ask the question that we should be asking. They ask the question that, that people are saying, we want God, we want his presence, we want revival, we want him to be closer to us. But are we ready? Because they ask the question we should be asking. Beth Shemesh asks, who can stand in the presence of the Lord, this holy God? Honestly, who can stand in the presence of the Lord, this holy God? Who can stand before the presence of the Lord, this holy God? The, the Israelite religious users, those who used God, well, they got slaughtered. The spiritual abuser, Eli, and that priesthood, well, well God left them. The, the, the tolerant idolat idolatry, well, God tore them down. The ignorant unbeliever, will they experience devastation in the presence of the Lord? The irreverent believers and the way they handled the ark, well, they were struck down. Who can stand in the presence of the Lord, this holy God? Can you? Can I? And then they say, to whom will the ark go up from here? In other words, get God out of here. It is not safe. Annie Dillard, she says this in her quote, on the whole, I don't find Christians sufficiently sensible, sensible of conditions. Does anyone have the foggiest idea of what sort of power we so blithely invoke or as I suspect, does no one believe a word of it? The churches are children playing on the floor with their chemistry sets, mixing up a batch of TNT to kill a Sunday morning. It is madness to wear velvet hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. For the sleeping God may wake someday and take offense or the waking God may draw us out to where we can never return. John the Apostle in the book of Revelation speaks about a day where we will all stand before the presence of the Lord. And he describes it this way, then the kings of the earth 
the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks and they said, fall on us. Hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. We want mountains to crush us for the great day of their wrath had come. Who and who can stand? It's the same question. You see, the question we're asking is, are we ready to stand before God? You know, when, when I think about me and coming under this text, I use God. I use His presence. I, I rob from God. This morning, Lord, please, please make this message powerful so that I can look great, so that I can become fat and that you can become lighter. I have multiple loves that I look to for fertility and provision with insurance policies. I, I don't think God's presence is that dangerous. You know, I, I handle the things of Christ irreverently. When I take communion, my mind's on, on next week's to-do list. I approach God with irreverence. Can I stand, am I ready for an extraordinary manifestation of God's presence? Oh, honestly, are we ready, are you ready? You know, we want revival, but are we really ready? Like cursed, if you were to just bump into God, would you end up running away, crying out for mountains to crush you? Who can stand in the presence of the Lord, this holy God? The answer is no one, not me, not you, not your friends and family, not this country. How do we get ready for revival? If we are serious about revival, how do we get ready? Who could stand in God's presence? Well, there was one and his name was Samuel. See, I read Samuel and I start getting jealous because as Lee referred to last week, Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. He was lying close to the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Can you imagine that? And it was from that place that the Lord called Samuel and spoke to Samuel. How come he gets to be in the presence of God? How do we get ready? Did he get ready? And Samuel says to Israel, he says, then Samuel addressed the house of Israel. He said, if you are truly serious, if you're truly serious about coming back to God, Rosebank, honestly, we can talk about revival, but we need to know, are we truly serious? Do we really want God to bring revival in our church, in our lives, in our nation? Are we serious or are we kidding around? Is it wallpaper? Do you know what you're asking for? Do I know what I'm praying for? Do you want the living God to meet you personally? Now, I didn't wanna give you just the Bible study answer. I didn't wanna give you what the pastor thought. I wanted to pull out words from the text that Lee is gonna unpack next week because I don't wanna get this wrong. I wanna get ready for the Lord. And Samuel, as they come to the second battle in their lives, Israel, but a very different battle, he uses these words to them. He says to them, rid yourself of multiple loves, of anything that's competing with God in your life. Serve him only. Solidarity, loyalty, uniquely saying, God, I am, I am gonna serve you only. And these Israelites, they confessed their wickedness. God, I've, I've rebelled against you in this way. God, I've used you in this way. God, I've abused your presence in this way. God, I've handled your things irreverently. God, I've been so ignorant of what I've actually been asking for. Please forgive us for our wickedness. And then Samuel plays the role of, of like Christ, this, this foreshadow. I will intercede, I will mediate for you. That's what Jesus does. And he takes a lamb and he sacrifices it. And that's what God does in Christ. You see, Jesus is our sacrificial lamb. And, 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 and while God, he slaughtered Jesus, he struck Jesus down, he devastated Jesus, he tore him down, he cut him up for you and for me 
so, so that we can come near to the presence of God. And Samuel, he takes a stone and he names it Ebenezer, for God is our help. This table is our stone. When you come to this table, you say, God is my help. And this is the treasure that Samuel unpacks for us. We can come to the living God, a consuming fire, and we can come, like the Hebrews writer says, with boldness because of the gospel of Christ. May he help us get ready for a unique and extraordinary visitation as we cry out for that. Rosebank, are you serious about wanting more of God? Let's pray together. God, who can stand in your presence? Who can stand in your presence today? Who can stand in your presence on that day? Only those, Lord, that are found in Christ. Lord, we think of Isaiah's words that if we do not stand by faith, we will not stand at all. God, would you help us realize what it is we're asking for? And if you are gonna move through this church and not leave this church and visit us with an extraordinary manifestation of your presence, oh God, may we cling to Christ. Lord, we confess our rebellion and wickedness before you. And we ask, please Lord, would you be merciful to us? pray this in your name and for your glory. May we become lighter and may you become heavier. In your name we ask, amen.